Welcome to episode 14 of the LPP podcast. LPP is the Life Process Program. It's Monday, and every Monday we offer a short and thought-provoking segment first thing in the morning. This is a weekly routine, something that we call Monday Morning Ammunition. I'm using this time with all of you to describe each of the Life Process Program's eight modules. We're going over one each week. We've already discussed module one, titled Self-Reflection, and module two, titled Values, And you certainly don't need to go back and listen to those episodes to make sense of this one, but you may find it helpful to do so, in which case, that's episode 12 and 13, which I've linked to in the show notes. Today, I'm speaking with founder of the Life Process Program, Dr. Stanton Peel, about LPP's third module, Motivation. Enjoy your Monday morning ammunition. I know you... um worked up a few questions before let me throw one of those at you zach go how can they distinguish their own intrinsic motivation from things that other people believe should motivate them tell me a little bit about that and and why it's helpful in the process we're engaged in i can kind of tell as a coach that people have come with canned responses that just sort of roll off a habitual repertoire you know and it's because well you were saying that you had an inpatient rehab that was people's last stop and you met with people who said things to you like well i'm destined to be addicted forever or i'm i'm going to die an alcoholic or things like that disease they start arguing me they have a disease sure that's the set of language that i would assume is visited upon a person and i'm not very i'm not interested in something that is so predictable that i know that a million other people could say i'm more interested in that individual And so as a coach, I'm wondering what kinds of things do you care about? Those are values. To what extent do you want to live your values more than you want to live your addiction, which seems to oppose them? And what kinds of things when there's little bits of light and you are excited about the future and you're motivated to change, what does that look like? And when people can talk about what really motivates them, what they're happy about, what they're optimistic about, what they enjoy that's getting more into their intrinsic motivation than I agree. Those are good, important. Those are good words, happy and enjoy what makes you feel good. And in the addiction field, I mean, we're, somebody has to call us up and pay us money and make an appointment to talk to us or, you know, fill out forms. So we don't have a situation that in our lives we might face. I mean, you're a school counselor of a sort where somebody comes in, And you ask them what they're doing there, and their explanation is, oh, Mrs. Brown sent me here. Right. Or my wife thinks I have a problem. Or I got arrested. Of course, DUI. So let me, well, I'm still going to throw it back to you. What if somebody comes to you, if they came to you, and they said, well, I wasn't thinking about changing my drinking, but, well, my wife complained about it. How... Is there a way to shift? That's an external explanation. Can you think about, or how would you think about moving that inward? Sounds like you value the relationship with your wife and the choices that you've been making have not jived with your wife's intentions about what your relationship would look like in a positive light. So I would I'd probably reflect on the person's basis for joining the program, which is, well, my wife kind of thinks something should change. And so maybe the, it's not that the thing should change, but more that the person value that cares about his wife. So if, exactly. if something really does need to change, then it's because... He cares about his wife. Right, he's telling me it's because his wife, yeah. Yeah, you're, it's sort of like asking, oh, why do you care what your wife thinks? And he could give a snide answer like, well, she can make my life miserable. <laughs> or he could give a, you know, a less external answer like, well, I want to stay married. Or... He could say, well, you know, I want my wife to respect me and uh, she cares for me or I care for her. I don't want to make her unhappy. And, you know, a lot of times those things are all together in the same ball of yarn. Um, you, you must get people. I mean, people don't give you straight narratives when you talk to them, do they, Zach? I mean, a lot of times. No, no, not usually. There's a bunch of stuff in there and you could pull out the old. Do you, uh, do you follow a pattern of trying to pull out the key themes or do you let them figure it out themselves or do they emerge on their own? 
How, how would you say you deal with diffuse material? They do usually emerge on their own. What the modules look like, if, for people listening who haven't seen them, they're, they're sets of questions you can kind of scroll down from top to bottom. And so since there are a series of questions, one thing I might do is key in on a, on a salient point from each answer. Or if you know they're brief enough, then maybe there's I give a summary at the end that I've pulled out a few key points that it seems like the person cares about most. And if there's a pattern to it, you know, if there are insights that keep popping up, I might mention that. So in other words, one, th- one thing you say to people is, you know, I can't help but notice you've mentioned your wife quite a bit. Right. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to say you're really concerned about your marriage or you really want your wife to admire you and maybe you feel she doesn't. Maybe you don't feel your behavior's up to snuff. Those are like inferences. But, you know, you can mention, well, you mentioned your wife 10 times. And, you know, it seems that she's very much on your mind, which that's a good thing. But uh, can you explore that a little bit? You can, you can take out the kernels in what they're giving you, not to knit them together, but to, you know, refine the mixture so that they're going to, you're going to ask them to address the thing that seems to be most prominent in their thinking. How do you deal, I mean, you, you've you run into some people who are slow to change, s- students and others. How do you prevent yourself from spinning your wheels and them from spinning their wheels and them from getting discouraged? Well, the people I have a relationship with at school, I work in a high school, as you mentioned, I front load this activity where I'm sort of trying to figure out, is there some difficulty here? And if so, can I have a dialogue with this person so that we can work through the most, uh, you know, that we can prioritize these difficulties and what we each need ahead of time? So I would say something like, it seems like you're having difficulty getting to class, what's going on? And they might give me an answer like, well, I want to go to class, but I'm hungry in the morning. I My bus gets there late. I need breakfast, so I go. And I'm afraid that if I go to class, they're not going to let me get breakfast. So we'll work something out. Well, I need you to be in class on time. You need to eat. So I wonder if there's a plan that we could work out so that each of us gets the thing we need. You can eat as much as you need to, which you deserve. And you get to class on time. And I always give this person the first crack of the problem. They may have an answer that they just hadn't quite articulated yet. And they needed to talk it out. Something like, well, I can get a ride in and I could get there earlier. So that way I can get breakfast and still get to class on time or something like that. It might be that this person just doesn't have the resources or the skills necessary to make this thing happen. In which case, um, I usually help them have a dialogue with another person involved. In this case, it might be the teacher. So that we can tailor the expectation so it gets closer to this person's ability to actually meet it. In other words, we could have a rule that the kid could be 15 minutes late as long as he makes up work or something like that. And actually, that's me getting into concepts from different modules. But the point is that this dialogue and the solutions that we have to a problem are collaborative. I usually pick one, two, three things that are key on my mind. And if there are other problems beyond three problems that we haven't worked out collaboratively, I put those on the back burner. In other words... I'm good with who they are, knowing that they're going to be developing over time. We're good with our relationship for now. That's one of many things I admire about your therapeutic technique. We said at the beginning that we've told the person that people can quit addictions. Take some, take Ozzy. He was smoking for 24 damn years. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's been a while. Um, and they have an explanation for it. I talked about that, um, my favorite motivational interviewing tape where the guy explains why he smokes and the therapist goes, oh, I guess you won't be able to quit. Um, and what you're doing is you're kind of just like going through, especially with young people, the kind of alternative scenarios and choices and laying out options for them. You're exploring their positives. Um, and, 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 and which motivation they want to pick out. And um, you can't get discouraged because you don't want to give them an excuse for getting discouraged. And Mm -hmm. um, 
you want to be patient and you want them to be patient with themselves and, you know, loving of themselves. Um, it, it, this We're getting into a course concept from Buddhism, radical acceptance. Um, you're not there to dislike or disapprove of any aspect of them because in general, when people end up with an addiction or in your office, they probably already got negative feelings about themselves already. And we're in a, we're not somebody that asks people to make a list of all the crimes they've committed and all the people they need to make amends to. We're not there to say, we don't want them crying on the floor like they've been a bad husband, the guy whose wife is complaining about their drinking. We're trying to explore the positive contours of their mind. That's so clear from the kind of work you do, isn't it, Zach? You're not, you're not there to make a child, a high school student, for example, feel negative about themselves. That's just not, that's sort of against the law of education and child rearing. No, yeah. But if I get myself, and I've done it, I'm guilty of having done it. And if I get myself spinning my wheels, I'll revert to what, you know, the ways of handling problems unilaterally that I'm used to, and they're not usually very effective. And one of the worst consequences of that is that, you know, I'm giving, I'm either feeding into an existing or I'm creating a new story for this child about themselves now, rather than letting them create their own story. I was, yeah. um, to that's a good your, way of talking about it. You know, they have to create their own, their own story, which is, you know, what we're, we're in the business. We, we have them write stories. And eventually, you know, they can write a story about the bad things that have happened to them. You can write a story about the decent things that have happened to them. But they've got to get control of the story. Let me, let me throw another question at you that's I know one that you've thought about. What about that short versus long-term motivation where some people can run out of the office saying, damn it, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And then, you know, they get out in the real world. How do you help them to maintain that motivation or extend it? How do you deal with it? I mean, I know you think about short-term versus long-term or enduring motivation. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm familiar with this personally, even in, you know, something you wouldn't call an addiction, maybe like uh, trying a new diet or a workout regimen and thinking, you know what, you know, I'll watch a YouTube video, say, and I'll hear the advice about what a what a, a great workout week would look like. And it's like twice in the gym and you're eating only asparagus or, or whatever. And I feel so motivated after watching it and thinking, all right, I'm going to go to bed and tomorrow it starts. And I might even do well at it for a day, two days. Maybe I can make it through a week, but I'm, I'm used to a certain way of living and, and certain challenges present themselves. I, I might desire one thing over another. I just haven't thought through all the variables maybe about what might make this whole new way of life difficult. It's kind of difficult to turn around a battleship 180 degrees all at once. And so, so. you're trying to think about how, how to build that short-term motivation into something workable in your long-term life, right? including all the other that pressures is the wrong word, things that are you're concerned about. You got a daughter, you got a wife, you got a job, you have extracurricular activities, you know, in that one moment when you're thinking about going to the gym, that's maybe all you're focusing on, but you're gonna to have to build this into your overall life package. And we've explored with people, you know, what their life consists of, what their problems are, what their issues are, what their values are. So we know that there's a whole range of things that you're going to have to put together. We're in a particular point in time here in life, so I'll just tell a little bit of a story combining family, values, and health. I, people in New York have been a little bit holed up lately because of the virus, and my daughter, Anna, has been calling me regularly to tell me to stay put. And... Um, I said, well, I want to go to the gym. And, you know, she's got all these explanations about you're going to be helping your health. But, you know, what if you get this virus and all? I'm 74, so I'm one of those people, you know, on the list of people that if you become infected, you're in bad shape. And so we did discuss, well, I could wear gloves. And, you know, you're supposed to wash your hands before and after. 
And, you know, I went to the gym and I correctly thought, you know, there aren't going to be many people in the gym because they're all worried. So I sort of was able not to get within four feet of anybody. But you are, you're not supposed to touch surfaces. So I put those little disinfectant claws in my hand the entire time I was in the gym. And so, you know, I had to work out a competing set of motivations. I don't want to get coronavirus. Um, I don't want to piss my daughter off and I have to explain to her when she calls tomorrow, you know, she doesn't want me getting it either. Big pain in her neck too. You have to balance all these things off. And, you know, I did go, she didn't want me to go and I went. Um, So I was doing something healthy, but balancing it in this case off something that could be potentially unhealthy. A person who's slightly less assertive might have their daughter call them and say, well, damn it you know what, this is important to her, she's right, I'll stick, you know, I'll I'll stay at home, and sort of know that that's not feasible. And you're saying you could have, you knew that you couldn't do that. You know, you were, like you say, there's a competing set of motivations there. But what you could do is try to work both in to some, you know, collaborative measure. I'm really happy that my daughter's concerned about me. I don't Mm -hmm. want to piss her off. But I had two very clear values in my mind. One is my state of mind. Um, as you were aware, I'm writing my uh, Life on the Addiction Edge uh, memoir. And I have to be in a good state of mind to do that. I have to get out of the house. I have, it was beautiful in New York today. And it was like 65 and sunny. And I'm not going to be a happy person if I'm not able to do that writing. And then the second thing I said to my daughter was, you know, Anna, you know, if I get a heart attack and drop dead, that's not going to be good either. Mm. So I had two values, my physical and my mental health, kind of one and number two. I mean, I am a psych- addiction psychologist. Those are pretty important to me. The most important thing in my life is writing this memoir. The most important thing in my life is staying physically healthy. The most important thing in my life is staying, you know, mentally on top of things. So my values were clear and I was able to elevate them even against some opposing force and, um, you know, it's not like I go to the gym every day, but I did go to the gym today and I felt better because of it. So when you were able to elevate that to sort of a meta level and say, I'm motivated by several things, not all of which are compatible, I have to work, I'm going to have to work this out somehow. That allows you to keep the things that truly motivate you on your mind in a realistic way day by day, moment by moment, rather than just, you know, having a lofty goal that you're going to do something and and perhaps not having thought it through. Maybe if you're in AA, you can spend all day, every day thinking about drinking or not drinking. <laughs> but we're an out, you know, outpatient doesn't even describe it. We're online. People are living their lives. And there's a million things. You're not in a residential rehab. Like you describe yourself, there's a million things that are flowing down on them. And you have to learn to negotiate those things. 